Hey everyone, it's me, Drew Offwallow, host of the Comment Section Show. Come join me and one of my iconic special guests every week on the show as we dive into the dreaded comment sections of our tagged videos and take down the most terrible men on the internet, period. Somehow, they won't go away no matter what I do, no matter how incredibly awful and mean I am to them, but I don't mind doing this work. In fact, if I'm being honest, I think it's God's work. So make sure y'all follow me on Spotify or wherever you get your podcasts for new episodes every Wednesday. Thank you for being a part of Raising Me. I'm Adrienne Stein, and this is where we take those everyday parenting challenges, big and small, right to the experts for advice. And I hate to be the one to say this out loud, but summer break is just about over. It actually is over for some kids in parts of the country. They're already back to school. Today, we have pro advice from a pediatrician, Dr. Christy Perkowski, and a longtime elementary school teacher, Holly Lalamond. First, they're friends, so that's just kind of fun, but the two of them together share valuable insight in setting our kids and us up for success this school year, physically, mentally, and emotionally, whether you're already back or you're just about to go back. Check it out. Holly and Dr. Perkowski, how are we even talking about back to school already? It's like just as soon as the summer starts, we get to a place where, well, now we've got to go back to school. Uh, Holly, let, let's, I want to get a little bit of background for both of you. Holly, you, you are a longtime teacher. I, I mean, 20 some odd years. Mm -hmm. Wouldn't know it by looking at you, though. I will say Thank that. Thank you. <laughs> right? That's generous. And you've seen a lot of changes when it comes to kids in school and going back to school. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I certainly have. I mean, I've been teaching for 20 years and just like everything around us is always changing, you know, expectations, things that kids are exposed to have changed drastically um, over these years. And so getting ready to go back to school is a little bit different and might need a little more extra preparation before we kick off in August, some of us. And that's not just for academically, that's for physically, mentally, emotionally as well, Dr. Perkowski. Yes, yeah, so that parents are not caught off guard. I always tell them that when you're thinking about going back to school, that's time to find out if your school needs any sports forms, participation forms, if your child takes any medications, or if there's any updates to their medical history where you might need to clue in the school nurse. Yep. Um, now is the time to get that all in order. We do asthma action plans, allergy action plans for kids with food allergies and environmental things. And so it's a great time to reach out to your doctor's office early, make sure that that's all in place. And then of course, making sure that they're up to date on immunizations. Oh yeah. So you don't get the little emails like, um, we're missing this record from Susie Q or, or little Johnny there. Okay. And you know, academically too, like through the summer, we, I, I know we've heard it, we've talked about it on the podcast, this summer slide or summer slump, however you want to say it, but what do you find academically we need to be thinking about early when it comes to our kids? Are there any, you know, is it reading? Is it math? Is it just, you know what, like kind of give ourselves some grace and just let the, the teachers do their thing when the kids go back? I think it's just worth a conversation in terms of getting them prepared to learn again. And it's as simple, you know, as saying everybody learns differently. You know, you're going to go in. It's a fresh start. That's really important for kids to remember that it's a fresh start. It's a new year. Um, and that learning how to advocate for yourself and asking for help early on is okay because that's what teachers are there to do. So I don't think, you know, you have to start with like homework or anything like that or pushing reading, especially if you have a younger reader who, you know, is still learning to put those pieces together. But just having a really good conversation around mistakes are okay. That's what school's for your teacher's there to help you, and you're going to learn amazing things this year, and just keeping it simple. And when you say advocate for yourself, that's as in the student, to be able to go to the teacher and really teaching those skills early on, mm -hmm. that the teacher is there to help you, and here are some words around asking for help. I think that's, yes, and I think for some kids, I was one of them, like recognizing when you don't know something is very difficult. So giving them, as you said, a phrase or a framework to how do you ask for help 
when something might look like it's going really well for kids around you, but you're struggling. Mm. So what words or what motions or cues can you use to get make sure you're getting help? You know, going back to school can be really stressful for kids, well, and parents, like, let's just be real. I mean, it can, can be, it, there's a lot of preparation that goes into all of it, but how do we look for signs that maybe our kids are feeling stressed out or anxious or nervous, how, however they're showing the signs? What are those signs and what can we do to support them if we're seeing that anxiety creep up? Well, I think the first thing is creating the space to be able to have those conversations with your child at home, because I know with three kids at home, getting ready for our whole world to be turned upside down, right? Now we're going to change all of our routines. We finally got it in place for the summer. And, and here we go. And here we, we go. go. And, yeah. and it's all new, right? It's like, well, what time does the bus come? Mm -hmm. And what bus is it? And, you know, what do you need for the first day? And what time is lunch? Do you need a snack? Are there food restrictions in your classroom? Like there's Right. We have so many things on our agenda when they're getting ready to go back to school. So having that space, time that you set aside where you are not distracted, you're not running your mental to do list to really talk with your child and ask them, you know, how are you feeling about going back to school? And what thing do you know anyone in your class? Have you met this teacher before? Mm -hmm. What what are you thinking? Are you, you know, do you have your backpack? Do you want to get it ready? And start thinking about what things that we need. And then you'll, you know, parents are the experts at their children. Mm -hmm. If there's some hesitation or worry or anxiety, you might notice that your child is avoiding the conversation. Mm -hmm. Like, you know, should we find your backpack? Like maybe later or, you uh -huh. know, really not engaging in that might be a sign that there's, that there's some stress, but certainly changes in appetite, changes in sleep patterns, changes in the their interest in things that they're normally excited about, that maybe they're shying away from, these would all be red flags for some worry. Then how do you help them? It's true. It's yeah. definitely true. And I think that preparation is everything. Yeah. So I think for younger kids where maybe the school itself is new or different, a visit, like even a drive-by, like mm. a gradual mm -hmm. introduction, like let's just drive by and, you know, and see what, maybe we can see the buses in the back or Maybe we could go play on the playground or maybe a friend that we know will be at school could meet us on the playground and, you know, things to kind of gradually reintroduce this idea and show that there are some things to be excited about. Yeah, and they ought to do like the meet the teacher and any time you can go to those, we we definitely try. Not everybody can make it, obviously, mm -hmm. but, you know, Holly, to you, like one of my biggest anxieties as a parent, especially when my kids were young, you know, well, I, have, I still have a youngster, but my middle, my middle and my oldest, are, they're older, middle school and high school. But I had so much anxiety about them not having friends or who are they sitting with or who is in their class? Like a couple of things. For one, what do you say to parents who are like stressed out ab about that and feeling that? And then two, how do you identify children who may be feeling like that, that mm -hmm. they're, they're feeling out like an outsider or not fitting in. Yeah. So I have a couple things on that. I think always to kind of um, piggyback on what Christy was saying, I think it's really important with parents and students to validate their feelings, mm -hmm. like validate, like it's okay to be nervous and to have conversations around specifically, can you pinpoint what it is um, that they're nervous about or anxious about. Um, maybe think of a time where they had that feeling and then they had success to kind of draw on that might help that. Um, I had the, I have three kids. I had the same feeling, especially around friends. You know, I think one thing is it's okay for parents to reach out to the teacher mm. and say just a short note, like my kid's feeling anxious or uh, you know, I'm really worried about friends. Teachers are there because we want to know. You know, you don't have to write a long thing. And you might often hear from the teacher, hey, give me the first week of school and I'll get back to you. Because yeah. kids, as we know, present differently in the classroom than they do at home. A hundred times. Do you I have sit gone, at a parent teacher conference? I've been like, and ask, who? Who are you talking about? <laughs> I'm sorry, what? Who's kid? Okay. And then, you know, you're really good at knowing kids. You can read, you know, you can read kids' body language and just really kind of trying to encourage them to sit within the group. Make sure, especially that first week, I always make sure they have a buddy to play with on the playground, you know, and that the new year is always a chance to start rebuilding and mm -hmm. starting a new community. And that's the job of the teacher. And then just following up with the parents, if you get a continued concern from them, 
and see if you need to look at other ways to help their child build friendships. Yeah, and you know, in those ages where kids are growing and changing so fast and like friendships change mm-hmm. and helping to navigate through that can be really tricky. It's definitely tricky. It's tricky all the way. Um, but I yeah. think, you know, a lot of schools have other resources, like guidance counselors and whatnot, small groups that we can put kids in to kind of draw them out a little bit. Sometimes a big group of people can be intimidating, but you can recognize that student and just supporting them and encouraging them without it being forced um, can help them kind of just get a little more comfort. And certainly when you've gone through those avenues and you're not sure that it's working, your pediatrician wants to know. We also have resources for children that are having difficulty with anxiety. And of course, anxious feelings are are normal Mm -hmm. during times of transition to some degree. But when it's impairing their ability to get through the school day, to go to school, you know, which happens, it it absolutely happens. And school attendance is so important. And so if it's certainly if um, anxiety or depression are affecting their school attendance, your pediatrician wants to know that right Mm -hmm. away. And we Mm -hmm. have resources as well. Though I do find that the resources within the school can be quite excellent, but sometimes we all need to be on the same page. Do you feel like you're seeing that more post-COVID? Because obviously a a lot of these kids, it was two or three years where it was hybrid learning or remote Mm -hmm. learning entirely, often through very key developmental ages. So are you seeing that anxiety more often now that we're, we're hopefully it's in the rearview mirror, um, at least as a pandemic situation? I mean, certainly there is an adolescent, you know, behavioral health crisis going right. on right. Um, with anxiety and depression. And I think it's multifactorial. I think that we we know that social media is a major player mental mm-hmm. health is dramatically and Certainly, there was a lot more screen use during the COVID years and and how that all has brought us to where we are today. You know, I can't speak to directly, but certainly the rates of anxiety and depression are are high. And that's why we need to address it early and and address it aggressively. You know, let's kind of talk about that screen time a little bit more. Social media, obviously, we know this is a major player, but just screen time in general, that is incorporated into the school day much more. My daughter comes home, she's doing her math on the iPad and said, where's the book? You know, and it's pictures of the book on the iPad. So it's all kinds of screens throughout the day. So how do we manage that so that we're not our kids aren't just staring at a screen all day, even when it is that they're staring at a screen doing their math or their English or whatever it might be. Well, Adrienne, you know that I love a family media plan. I always talk about this. I love a family media plan. And I always think that times of transition are great times to revisit these things because we all, I tell all of my patients, we all live in the real world. And I ask the question about screen time at every single well child check. And I say, what are your family's screen time rules? And inevitably the answer is like a big sigh from the parent. And they always say it's too much. You yes. Know? And so, you know, my follow up question to that is, OK, well, what are you know, what are you doing to try to mm-hmm. regulate it? And that varies family to family. And what's going to work for one family does not necessarily work for another. How do you pull back? Because that's what I think, you know, we were really good in the beginning when the, our teenager got her phone and all the things. And, you know, the just naturally as time passes, like we don't have the capacity to check text messages and all the social media, media things, whatever they might be every day. I and mean, we just don't. And we trust her, right? She, yeah. You know, uh, but, uh, you know, there is a, a point where I'm like, okay, put your phone down. Put your phone down. We're in the car. Put your phone down. Like, we're just going to Target. What, you, you know, how do you pull it back? Well, you have to remember that it was designed to be addictive. Yes. Um, mm-hmm. That is how it works. And so just like so many addictions, it's, it's a really hard thing to just say, I think I've had enough and put it down right, and walk right. away. And yeah. I think that that expectation is unrealistic for anybody. And so that's where using some of, I mean, I'm not particularly technical, but I can navigate it. You know, some of the restrictions with Mm -hmm. the amount of time Mm -hmm. spent on certain websites and restricting certain social media and just making so that it's not an option. It just goes off. And I would say have a very honest conversation with your child about this is, it's kind of not your fault that you want to keep looking at it and picking it up and seeing what happened. It was designed that way. And so we need, that's why we need to put these things into place to try and keep it under a health, you know, in a healthy amount. 
Because it's the fear of, I have three teenagers. Yeah, okay, so, so you're so in the I, thick of it too. I, yes, I have three in high school. And so, I yeah, I think you have to establish boundaries. We have a child or two that turns their phone into us at night before oh. they go to bed. Um, you know, I have no friends who sometimes they turn the internet off yep. in their house just because they can't stop and they're afraid they're going to miss a text message or whatnot. So I think um, it goes back to establishing some boundaries and, you know, you can have your phone back in the morning and we've, we've done it all as with three teens. I bet to the beginning of the school year, you know, especially if you're, uh, what I've not just observation, um, not in our case uh, in particular, but when kids move into middle school, they often seem to get phones. Thankfully, my 12 year old has not asked and is not interested, but you know, how do you start setting those ground rules early if a, a child is getting a phone for the first time going into the new school year? It's a tricky one. I know. A big I, listen, oh. hey, listen, if you have the answer to this, you got you guys got to play the lottery right now. I, I, it's, it's a tricky I know, know, thing as right. a parent because you don't want your kid to be the kid without the phone. I know that we were really slow. Um, and this is me as a parent, we were really slow at how many sort of apps our kids were on. Like there's Snapchat and yep. Instagram, and now there's something called like Visco or something like that. There's oh, something, that's a new one. Tell yeah. us more. I, I don't really know a lot about it. <laughs> I'm making really a know. note for my 16 year old. Yeah, I really don't it? know. I, and so I don't even think I'm saying it right, but I think we were like, you can have this. Like they don't have Facebook or those kind of yeah. things. So I think when they first got the phone, I was like, no, you may not have yeah. all of this. You can have this. And you're going to get pushed back. You, yeah. you just are. Yeah. It's oh, yeah. natural. And then we gradually like released more. Um, After they prove their responsibility. Yeah. yeah. It, right. I mean, it's, it's tricky. Yeah. It's really tricky. I think the wait for eight campaign can be something that's really good for families yeah. where you sign this contract that takes effect once 10 other individuals in your grade, in your school, have also signed this contract where you are pledging to not get a smartphone. That's not to mm -hmm. say a phone for some sort of communication, right. but a smartphone. And that helps parents that are worried about their child being the only one yeah. that's not included. And that's like the point of this database, the wait for aid, is that you can find the other people that are who are like minded and who are going to make this push. And so I think that can be helpful for people that are worried about. But we can't be the only one. But I think that as time continues to evolve, you won't be the only one. I think we are mm -hmm. really understanding how um, consuming these phones are for these adolescents and the effects on the developing brain yes. different than an adult brain. And, and more, even more, the physical impact with this tech neck that, you know, just the looking down between it's mental, it's physical, all the things. And, I, you know, the anxiety of just the pings, pings, pings. I mean, we could go on. I mean, um, but back to school, um, you know, I also think too about, post covid as we were talking about that that there's such a focus on like health and cleanliness and you know hand washing and all the things so and you know having a preschooler going into kindergartner at home i know as soon as we start school we are going to have colds coughs flu all the things and as a family of five you're like okay how long is this one going to take to get through the house so how do you you know do you have any like pro tips on staying healthy no matter your <laughs> child's age throughout the school year. Yes, absolutely. So the first thing is that in the fall, you're going to get your COVID and your flu boosters every yep. year. It's so important. It doesn't mean that your child won't get COVID or won't get flu, but the chances of it being severe illness decrease dramatically. The chances of getting it decreases, mm. which means the chances of passing it to other people decreases. I mean, this is, this is low hanging fruit. This is an easy thing you can do to protect yourself. And then outside of that, it's the basics. It's the bedtime and the, the regular routine bedtime mm -hmm. and good sleep, which I would tell parents, you start that one to two weeks before back yes. to school. Okay, yes. so that was going to be my next yes. question is that routine. 
Absolutely. That so it is hard. So it, right now it's summer and I'm doing my well child checks and I ask every well child check about sleep. And I usually ask, what time do you go to bed? Mm-hmm. And every answer right now is, well, normally it would be eight o'clock, but right now it's eight forty five, nine o'clock. And if right. you're telling the pediatrician nine o'clock, you mean nine thirty. Right, that's right. okay. I can right. I'm and your, your too. heart is palpitating yeah, like, yeah. oh my gosh. Okay. Stressful. Well, right. Except that I understand yeah, because it's course. light outside and we're packing so much into this fun summertime. And it feels good to be a little bit more relaxed and less regimented if your child can still thrive with that. But during the school year, I know my kids come home those first couple weeks so tired. Yes. They almost don't. Sometimes they don't even want to like tell you about their day. And it's not because there's anything bad. They're just wiped. Mm -hmm. And so ensuring that adequate sleep, having a routine bedtime every night, the same routine, Mm -hmm. getting rid of the screens. I always say this an hour or two before bedtime so that your brain can unwind. That's all really important from the beginning. And and how do you see it manifest in the classroom with kids who are not in a regular routine or getting enough sleep at night? Yeah, I mean, it happens throughout the whole school year sometimes. And so, yeah, they're a little more, they're sleepy. They're a little less engaged. Um, they want to rest in the middle of the day. Simple things like that. Like I, Or they'll verbalize. I'm so tired. I can't do my math right now. I just need to do this. And so I echo that, um, you know, it's hard to come off summer. We're like Mm -hmm. doing everything. And that's what summer's for. We're supposed to have fun, be with our friends, be with our families, not have as much of a routine, but it is significant, I think, to the success of kids' transitions for you to start some type of bedtime routine I mean, we all remember like tomorrow's the first day of school and it's light out. And you're like, what? I'm yeah, supposed to sleep? Right. Well, and you're excited and anxious yes. exactly, and all the things. Exactly. Sure. So starting to ease that in yeah. a little bit. Um, but yeah, it, it can affect how they go about their day and how they interact and and attendance. You know, if they're arriving yes, late. Sure. I'm, actually the, I'm not doing this interviewing, but I would love to ask you, Holly, what <laughs> yeah, happens? Please do. Jump what in. happens? When, you know, when they come late, like how disruptive is that? I know that I, you know, I personally, you know, when it's a dentist appointment or you kind of can't avoid it, I still don't like how it feels when I know we're like pulling in late and I'm signing them in and I'm sending them in and I'm like, just find your class, you know? Well, so much of school is routine and structure. Yeah. And so it's like, you know, kind of coming in late to a movie, you know? Mm -hmm. And so... Um, it happens, you know, dentist appointments are fine, but sometimes we do have families that struggle getting to their school on time. And we tell them, or I tell them that first part of the day is so critical because it sets them up for the rest of the day. Mm -hmm. Like coming in, you know, our school, a lot of schools Mm -hmm. offer breakfast and they come in, they go to their lockers and get their breakfast. They're socializing with their friends. It's setting the tone for the day. But if you're late and you're coming in midway through a math lesson, then you're left feeling panicked sometimes as a student. It adds to anxiety. Yes, like I don't know what's happening right now because I've missed that foundation of the lesson or whatever it is. So it can be anxiety provoking Mm -hmm. for them. So really, it's hard and I get it. It's so hard. But those first few minutes of the day might seem like there's not a lot going on, but there's a lot going on socially. And just getting somebody's brain and body ready to learn for the day. Yeah, setting the the scene, essentially, for the whole day. A lot of my patients tell me they take advantage of the school breakfast, which is would be another thing that I would say is helpful in terms Mm of, um, you know, setting yourself up for your best health and learning performance is having a full belly. And um, the school breakfast help with, you know, I know that the mornings, it it just seems like a lot has to happen in a short period of time to get them there on time. and. The fact that there's when there's breakfast at school, taking advantage of that, I think, can help. And I'm I'm sure hungry students is is a challenging the class. I mean, too. think about us as adults. If we're hungry it's not pretty. and tired, no. right? You no, know, no. we're hungry. It is not and so pretty. think about, you know, when we start our day, even as parents trying to get ourselves out the door and we're all like disarrayed or you're no. running late or whatever, that is going off to a child too. And so getting to school and just starting your day, routine is key. I wonder too about, um, you you know, some things that come to mind as we're starting to get to the school year, you start, especially with the younger ones, like 
well, are they reading? Okay, mm-hmm. is their language good? Like, how, from a teacher's perspective, yeah. how can parents work with teachers from when, you know, we want our child or feel like we our child needs individual attention, whether it is like a, a learning situation or, um, you know, a, a mental health concern that we might have? I think um, communication is key. We know that just as humans, like communicating concerns to the teacher, whether it's in an email. I often say, give your kids, like it's a transition, no matter how old they are, give them the first month, like let Mm -hmm. them have opportunities to settle in. As teachers, you know, it's a fresh start. We have the information in terms of how they performed the year before, but sometimes a lot of us want to just get our own perspective. Mm-hmm. So giving that time, I know that's scary. I, I I experienced it with my own kids and waiting can feel like forever, but really developing a trust uh, in terms of who you have as a teacher and being transparent about your concerns and allowing just a little bit of time for the teacher to do their own assessment. Mm-hmm. If it's significant and it has like a medical diagnosis or something behind it, that's often provided when you register and you send your stuff in to the school nurse, but it's okay to let the teacher know this is what's going on. And I guess, Dr. Perkowski, too, like, you know, you think, okay, my child's going into kindergarten, they should be doing this, or mm-hmm. first grade or fifth grade or whatever the grade is. How do you help parents understand like milestones and, you know, in some cases probably relieve a little anxiety and in other cases, like, you know, we should dig in a little bit further here. Yeah. I mean, this is something that we start looking for from literally the first well child check, you know, we're monitoring milestones from two weeks, two months, four months, six months, all those routine well visits. And I think a lot of times parents feel like, whoa, we're already coming back in three months. We're coming back in two months. You know, there's so many wellness visits and that's because development is so dynamic Mm -hmm. and it's changing all the time. And so whenever I do identify something that feels like it might be a little bit of delay, you know, a child isn't really, doesn't have this number of words we would expect at 18 months or something like that. We raise those concerns early because we know that if we intervene early, that can really help with the kindergarten readiness. And that's the framework that I put it in when I tell people, you know, huh, you know, I would expect a little bit more language development at this point, or I'm noticing something with the articulation or, you know, something along those lines. People usually say, but she'll talk or, you know, and and I'm like, of course, but I put it in the light of, we want this child to hit the door on the first day of kindergarten, ready to engage in school. And so that's why we intervene early and get the evaluations early and establish services early in the event that, that they're needed. And sometimes they're not, you know, parents do, you know, like I, like I also said, development is so dynamic. It is mm-hmm. equally normal to walk at nine months and 15 months. Like that's right. a huge window, but they're right. both totally normal and every child is going to develop differently. But when we see red flags for development that may be lagging a little bit, I reassure parents that by intervening, we're going to make progress and that's, that's always going to help. So, and most schools have, um, what's called an MTSS system, which is like a multi-tiered support system um, for kids that might be taking a little bit longer to establish and learn their foundational skills. And those are often identified within the first six weeks of school. So I always say it's just an extra scoop of something. It's just an extra dose of instruction or intervention. So schools everywhere have some type of support system for those kids who might be coming in and maybe didn't hit the benchmark and didn't land where we wanted them to at the end of a specific grade level, there are systems in place to catch those kids and provide them with extra academic support. Sometimes parents will raise concerns that are coming from preschool to me and say, but mm-hmm. what will happen in kindergarten? Mm-hmm. And I tell them, like, believe me, they've mm-hmm. seen this before, yes. you know, like, and I just tell them to be really open, you know, reach out to the, you know, before you've started at school, it's always hard to know who to reach out to. But, you mm-hmm. know, just whatever the contact for the school is, start there, let them know your concerns, be an open book, you know, right. and I think that the school has probably encountered it before and has so a plan true. for this. It yes. feels so big when it, you're going through it with your child, especially your first one. Uh, but the school has seen it Doctors have seen it. Teachers have yes. seen it. And uh, it's all good. You know, if there was one piece of advice you could offer to parents today to help them get 
ready for back to school, what would it be? Dr. Perkowski first oh, to you. Oh, gosh. Um, well, I would say I would re- emphasize the sleep routine. Yeah. I, can't even, I, can't even, I can't even tell you, though, you know, like the huge majority, like so many of the problems that I see in, in the office mm-hmm. come back to kids that are really, really tired. Really? And they, they really do. And and I see so many of my patients are quite young, like less than five. Right. And there's so many, like you know, behavioral concerns. He has a hard time winding down. He has, mm-hmm. you know, he's, he's off the wall. He's climbing the walls. You know, we and. And so often the parents will ultimately, you know, try different things and telling me that they moved the bedtime back is like, like such a fix. Mm, And so I would definitely emphasize that and just being, um, taking advantage of the opportunity to reestablish your routines. You know, Mm -hmm. what are we, what are we going to do about meals and meal prep to make sure we eat healthy? What are we going to do about our sleep? What are we going to do about our screens this year? You know, and how are we going to carve time out for our family to still connect when the schedule feels really full so that the parents can check in regarding their mm-hmm. children's feelings and all of the things that are developing as they're getting started. Yeah, I think I think it comes back to that routine and structure. I'm just thinking like what giving your kids some type of role, no matter how young they are, like what is your outfit going to be tomorrow? Like you think about those hectic mornings, especially working parents. Um, giving some responsibilities to kids is really important because it gives them that sense of ownership and a sense of independence. So put your snack out for tomorrow or, you know, what are you going to wear to school tomorrow and laying it out the night before, depending on their ages. Like, you know, do you have PE or art class tomorrow? Giving them some sense of ownership. They're very capable early on and it helps really foster those independent skills, which they need in order to get through the day. So that structure and like routine Mm -hmm. and giving them ownership of something, I think also helps alleviate that anxiety that they might feel as they're getting ready to go back to school. Yeah. Setting them up for success. We actually, we call, I say, be kind to future you. Go make your lunch now. Mm -hmm. So we don't (laughs) be good to future you. Anyway, thank you both so much for coming in. We're ready for back to school. Let's (laughs) do it. All right, we'll have more recess sources on our website, wgme.com slash raising me. Appreciate you guys so much. Thank you. Thank you. Fresh start, new year. Absolutely love that. And like Holly and Dr. Borkowski say, routines are so key right now. And it's really important to be empowering our kids with those responsibilities to set them up for success, not just in the school year, but beyond too. And I thought it was particularly interesting what Dr. Perkowski said about sleep, that a lot of the issues and the troubles that she sees in her office come from a lack of sleep. I know we're trying to ease that bedtime back a little bit at a time right now, though, you know, be a little real here. It's a little lax as uh, we are trying to soak up the last bits of summer like so many of us. I hope the new school year just goes great for you or is going great if you're already back. Thank you for listening to Raising Me. I'm Adrienne Stein. This episode is edited by Megan Littlefield and produced with Nate Eldridge. Please follow Raising Me wherever you get your podcasts. And of course, a positive rating and review is greatly appreciated because it helps others to find the message. Wherever you are, I hope you learn something new and get to take a little time for you. <laughs>